welcome to the latest in a series of webinars uh, we, we're doing together with MSD's uh, European and Brussels operation. Um, the topic of today's event, Bridging Inequalities in the EU, Addressing Post-COVID Challenges in Cancer Prevention in Central uh, and Eastern Europe. Um, we uh, are very obviously a timely topic uh, across the whole of the EU and indeed throughout the Western world. Um, the COVID pandemic has had a huge impact uh, on treatment of uh, other illnesses uh, and healthcare challenges, uh, but nowhere is this uh, challenge more acute than in the countries of Central Eastern Europe that have traditionally had a much lower level of healthcare spending and funding of their healthcare systems. And we are um, faced, as one of our speakers said on a previous webinar, a tsunami of uh, untreated, undiagnosed uh, cancer cases um, that uh, all governments are scratching their heads about um, for good ideas, how to deal with them. But the challenge is uh, enormous. Um, I'm delighted to have a great lineup of uh, speakers today. I'll introduce them shortly. But first of all, um, I would like to uh, invite uh, David Earnshaw from the MSD Brussels Policy Office uh, to say some opening remarks and really set the scene for uh, this webinar's discussion. Over to you, David. Great. Thank you very much, Simon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Earnshaw, and I work on European public policy issues with MSD. We are absolutely delighted to have initiated this seminar. Together with healthcare actors, uh, we want to create a Europe that one day will provide the same level of oncology treatment to all European cancer patients, no matter where they live or work. We really do need to get beyond a two-speed Europe or even a 27-speed Europe in cancer prevention and treatment. Health equals wealth as the ongoing pandemic is really reminding us. The topic of this seminar is cancer prevention. More than one in every four deaths in Europe is due to cancer. Cancer is the second leading cause of death behind cardiovascular disease. Every one of us knows someone, a friend, a colleague, a loved one, who has been diagnosed with cancer. At the same time, no less than nearly half of all cancer cases are preventable. It really is a good question whether we as a society are doing enough to stop this cancer pandemic. For instance, our healthcare systems spend on average only half of 1% on immunization, which includes the only cancer prevention vaccine against HPV. Central and Eastern Europe has the worst cancer incidence mortality ratio. In the European Union's beating cancer plan, the Commission focuses on removing inequalities across the EU, including access to treatment. Medicines reach patients in the CEE countries later and in more limited numbers than in the rest of the European Union. And equally, only very little attention is paid to prevention. And minimal mortality rates, meaning potentially preventable deaths, are twice those of the big five Western European countries. This is the cost of non-Europe measured in human lives. Our seminar today is entitled Prevention as a Key Pillar of Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. Over the next couple of hours, our guests will be trying to find answers to some fundamental questions about how to bridge inequalities in the Central and Eastern European countries when it comes to prevention. We will look at questions such as how can the European Union help countries in Central and Eastern Europe to meet the targets for cancer prevention set out in the Beating Cancer Plan. Another question, what programs, measures and financial instruments can help? We might want to look at whether a new recovery and resilience fund focused on health systems is needed for the post COVID era. And also what needs to be done locally in countries to ensure efficient implementation of the Beating Cancer Plan. Governments, civil society, patient advocacy groups, our pharmaceutical industry colleagues across Eastern Europe are often asking us how the European Union can help reduce inequalities in cancer care and prevention. 
But also, we need to remember that up until now, our European governments strongly argue that their healthcare competences need to remain almost exclusively with them, which really does make it very difficult to get beyond a 27 speed Europe in healthcare. Most CE countries, for example, don't even have national cancer control plans. And out of those that have, nearly a quarter have insufficient funds to implement them properly. Now is a really good time to pose questions like these as the next reshaping of Europe's pharmaceutical regulatory environment approaches. A review of the so-called Pharma Aki is being conceived within the Commission, just as the beating cancer plan is reaching the implementation phase. We invited guests today from across Europe and from different sectors to share their perspectives and to offer solutions about how to improve cancer prevention in the CEE countries. The aim should be to eventually reduce amenable mortality to bridge the cancer treatment gap. But how? This is the overall topic of this series of seminars. Let me just conclude this introduction by thanking everyone for participating, both speakers and audience. This is obviously one of the most important issues in Europe today. Uh, and there really are very many urgent issues to address in Europe. So thank you everyone in advance for giving your time to this important subject. Back to you, Simon. Thank you, David. Um, great, uh, great introduction, great scene setting there. Uh, let's move on with the first part uh, of today's webinar, which is uh, from with Philippe Roux, who is uh, head of unit in the European Commission's DG Sante, the department responsible for uh, health. Uh, issues. Uh, Mr. Ru is in charge of health integration uh, and um, information. I think that's correct. Um, so I'd like to hand the fl floor to, to you, Mr. Ru, to um, tell us about some of the initiatives the EU has been has launched in the in the in the cancer field and more generally. Thank you, uh, Simon, and um, thank you first of all for inviting DG Sante. Um, to um, contribute to this uh, webinar series, um, as um, was said uh, before, an important one, an important thematic. Um, I'm really happy to uh, contribute as much as possible to uh, your exchanges uh, on um, strategies for cancer prevention and care. And uh, as um, uh, it's clear that uh, it's become um, all the more urgent through the pandemic. Um, just to contribute to the scene uh, setting, um, uh, it's, it's clear that uh, Europe uh, alone accounts for a quarter of global cancer cases. And um, in the EU, cancer is the second leading cause of mortality with 1.3 million deaths and 2.7 million diagnoses occurring each year. So what is, even without um, the crisis, uh, what is interesting to note is that cancer deaths are expected to increase by 24% in 2035. And of course, the societal impact of the disease is um, only evident in life, not only evident in life loss, but also in economic expenditures, currently estimated to exceed 100 million euro. So consequently, uh, the need to address cancer treatment and prevention is a top priority objective for the European Commission. Um, as said, uh, the COVID-19 emergency further did ex exacerbate the necessity to tackle cancer at EU level. Well, not only at EU level worldwide, I would say, but at EU level too. The pandemic has significantly affected the entire cancer pathway and disrupted, disrupted cancer treatment, delayed screening, impacted access to medicine and reduce the quality of life and follow care for patients and survivors. COVID-19 has added a new layer of risk for patients and created more worries and stress for families, which is often forgotten. An estimated 1 million cancer case could, could be undiagnosed in Europe. Up to one in two people with potential cancer symptoms we are not urgently referred for diagnosis. And one in every five cancer patients in Europe are currently still not receiving the surgical and chemotherapy treatments they need. 
Data collected by WHO suggests that clinicians across Europe saw 1.5 million fewer cancer patients in the first year of the pandemic. Urgent cancer referrals were cut by up to half due to the pandemic. The consequences of control measures against COVID-19 likely had a significant impact, in particular in Central and Eastern Europe countries, which have already been experiencing significant challenges, as said before, in delivering cancer care prior to COVID-19. Several studies have highlighted in the past why disparities in cancer burden between Western and Central and Eastern Europe countries, with the latter showing increasing incidence and mortality rate of tobacco-related and screening-detectable cancers with a lack of decline in overall cancer mortality. For instance, a survey in 2019 found that in Bulgaria, 94 of the patients reported that their cancer was only detected after seeing a physician due to the suspicion of a problem, whilst only six reported detection via screening programs for an unrelated health problem. Similarly, this survey has also revealed that only 14, 47 of patients began treatment within one month of their cancer diagnosis in the Sketch Republic, Hungary, and Slovenia. Only 46 of the Central and Eastern Europe countries have implemented screening programs for cervical breast and colorectal cancer. Together with Greece, Bulgaria, and Slovakia are the only EU member states which lack of population-based breast cancer screening programs. Such disparities have been attributed to several factors, of course. And significant discrepancy in investment and allocation of resources in health systems and infrastructure between Western and Central and Eastern European regions. Consequently, the pandemic restriction in Central and Eastern Europe countries are likely to have had an even bigger impact on access uh, screening to cancer screening, treatment, and options for core quality care. If we look at screening, uh, the impact of COVID-19 has prevalently affected screening programs across the EU. In Western European countries, such as Italy, screening rates fell by 38% for breast cancer, 43 for cervical cancer, and 46 for colorectal cancer in 2020, compared to 2019. Um, corresponding in reality to 2.5 million fewer screening appointments for these three types of cancer. It is likely that this trend was equally followed in Central and Eastern Europe countries, potentially resulting in even greater losses, as I said. As an example, in Slovenia, there was a complete cessation of all three cancer screening programs, as well as significant drop in oncological referrals, first, first outpatients visits, X-ray, mammograph, and ultrasounds. In total, an estimated 100 million cancer screening tests were not performed in Europe as a result of the pandemic. European oncology experts agree that it could take up to 12 months to clear the backlog of people waiting for being screened for, can for cancer screening. This is an alarming effect, uh, considering that, for example, for breast cancer, a surgical delay of 12 weeks for a year is estimated to potentially lead to 12,000 excess, excess deaths across Europe. So figures are impressive. The effect of the pandemic were also observed on cancer treatment. Treatment delay due to COVID-19 in 2020 are deemed to have affected one in two cancer patients in Europe and continue to affect one in five. Additionally, an, uh, an estimated one in 10 European cancer patients are not receiving the radiotherapy they need due to concern around COVID-19. The backlogs in diagnosis and treatment will have significant repercussion on cancer patient survival and quality of life in Europe. As a, real, as a result, sorry, we have to count with an increase in incidence and mortality in the coming years. The European Commission is committed uh, to addressing the challenges of cancer care and associated impact of COVID, um, mainly by supporting member states and stakeholders uh, through Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, as was mentioned. 
The plan is one of the Commission flagship initiative and a main priority in the area of public health. It is a cross-cutting priority with many policy areas making important contributions, including the lessons learned from the COVID pandemic. As you certainly know, the plan will address cancer in a holistic way through four pillars, prevention, early detection, diagnostics and treatment, and quality of life of, of cancer patients and survivors. As such, it, it integrates the lessons from the COVID-19 in all the mentioned pillars, including the need for coordination, effective partnership, support of vulnerable groups, and contingency planning for continuity of cancer care in future crises, because this is not the last one, unfortunately. Overall, this will aim to facilitate structural improvement uh, for a more sustainable cancer pathway. Through a focus on cancer prevention and lifestyle, the plan also will benefit the other major communicable, uh, non-communicable diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases, obesity, and diabetes, which are also pro very problematic in the EU. A horizontal uh, theme for the cancer plan is addressing the significant and accept unacceptable differences between and within member states, and of course, between socioeconomic population group in access to prevention and care. To address this theme, the Cancer Plan put forward as one of its flagships the establishment of a cancer inequality registry. This initiative will aim to identify cancer trends, disparities, and inequalities between member states and regions. As such, it highlights the importance of a solid and comparable data to pinpoint areas of improvement and guide uh, policies and actions to tackle cancer inequalities across Europe, both at EU national and regional levels. In addition, through the EU for Health program and other financial instruments, the Commission is supporting member states in health reform and moving forward towards sustainable and resilient health care systems equipped to address the cancer backlog and tackle any shortage, whether that's concerned medicines, products, or equipment. And the figures are quite interesting uh, in the field of health for those who know um, the poor investment we have had so far, a total of 4 billion has been unmarked for actions addressing cancer, 4 billion. A first wave of call has already been launched in July. And it is worth mentioning that the four actions in this wave are to support member states, one, on HPV vaccination, two, to set up new comprehensive cancer centers on more common cancer and cancer conditions, three, establish a network connection existing with between existing and new comprehensive cancer centers, and four, strengthening ELs telemonitoring services for treatment of cancer patients to reduce infection risks. Very important, this um, dimension of telemedicine, because in, in regions where there was a lack of uh, medical services, I mean, ELs has a huge potential. And now a second wave, of course, was uh, launched on 4, 14 of October to close on 25 uh, January 2022. And that's interesting for us for the audience because they can uh, indeed benefit from these. It contained we eight areas for brands. The first one to support actions to improve access to human papillomavirus vaccination. So very important initiatives to be supported here. The initiative LC Lifestyles for Health for All, promoting LC school environments. Another area to reduce liver and gastric cancer caused by infections. For the EU cancer treatment capacity and capability mapping project, to create a cancer su survival smart car, for cancer diagnosis and treatment for all, for the computer aided drugs uh, of cancer therapy project, sorry, and for boosting cancer prevention through the use of European Court um, against cancer and other concerned actions. So a number of areas where they are possibilities. COVID-19 has reminded us that health is not only the responsibility for the health sector. And I think it is also an important message here for me. Uh, instead of good uh, public health and strong resilient health system requires a genuine health in all policy approach. It's very important. If we don't have a health in all policy approach, it's very difficult to have results, tangible and solid results. The pandemic has also shown a light on the tendency of underfinance and underprioritized national health systems. 
with the EU for Health uh, program and the, Reunions, the Re and the Recovery and Resilience Facility, the Commission will deliver specific support for health reforms and resilient health systems. The European institutions recognize that governments and public health authorities cannot alone address the increasing health and social economic challenges associated with cancer. An integrated health in all policies and multi-stakeholder approach is needed to effectively reduce the impact on cancer. A strong commitment and full cooperation of everybody is needed to effectively implement the cancer plan and its actions. That is why for me, the exchange like this seminar with the endeavor to address the post-COVID challenges in cancer prevention uh, in, uh, and uh, bridge uh, inequalities in the EU are so important. Thank you. Great, thanks uh, very much, uh, Mr. Hu. I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised, but you paint a, uh, a very challenging picture. Um, uh, some of those statistics are, are really uh, quite, quite worrying. Um, let's uh, then move on with the next part um, of uh, the webinar, which is a panel discussion. And allow me to just briefly uh, introduce um, our panelists. We have uh, from Romania, Professor Patriciu uh, Akimas uh, Kadariu, who is um, the secretary of the, uh, he's an MP uh, and the secretary on the, uh, this is the English translation, I hope it's correct, the Committee for Health and the Family. Uh, Professor Akimas is also uh, a former, it was a former government minister. So he'll have some very interesting views on what it's like to fight within government to, to make healthcare spending a priority. Um, and he's an oncologist uh, by background. Uh, I'm just going along my screen. Uh, so next we have Mike Morrissey, who's the chief executive of the European Cancer Organization, uh, which works to improve cancer treatment and outcomes. Uh, William Flanagan from Open Sky, which is uh, a consultancy that uh, uh, works with data uh, and has some interesting results and uh, analysis um, on uh, cancer treatment and um, presumably on uh, on the issue, on issues of e health and telemedicine that Mr. Rue has flagged up. And I think we have uh, Antonella. I think you're on. You're there as well, aren't you, Antonella? Yeah, great. Hi there, Antonella. Nice to see you uh, again. Antonella has joined us. Yeah, she also spoke last year at one of the first events we did in this series. Uh, Antonella uh, comes from the um, European Cancer Patient Coalition, where she's uh, a director. So we've got a good range of perspectives uh, and voices. Um, Maybe I can open uh, the discussion with uh, a, a sort of general question and then invite all of the speakers to um, give their, their sort of take, depending on their area of expertise. So given the existing inequalities in treatment and outcomes between the countries of Central and Eastern Europe and the, the other parts of the EU, uh, plus the impact of the COVID pandemic, what do you think can be done to improve uh, outcomes? And uh, Professor, maybe we could come to you first on that. It's a very, very broad question. Don't feel obliged to answer every aspect of it. This time we have, uh, we have over an hour for the debate, but um, what, for you are the what, what for you are the priorities there? What needs to be done most urgently? Well, that's exactly what I wanted to say. It's quite a complicated answer, Mr. Taylor. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Patricia Kimash Kadario. My background is a, I'm a gynae oncologist and trained as surgical oncologist as well. And I've graduated the master's in advanced oncology at the University of Ulm. Um, so um, yeah, uh, I'm very little a politician. Uh, I'm much of a doctor, to, to be honest, and uh, I served as a Minister of Health during a technocratic government. Uh, and yeah, at, that, yeah. at that point, uh, I've tried to, to finalize and uh, could realize, a, uh, finalize a project of an NCCP, which was actually thrown away. And this is my motivation at, at this point to, to 
be in the, the parliament. And this is my, my goal to be able to uh, work with my colleagues on, on an NCCP. Okay. Now uh, there's cancer, they, there's COVID and there's Eastern Europe or part of Europe, uh, which are not that happy about it. And uh, eventually we all die. Uh, and uh, we, uh, the aging of population is the, the most important factor in increasing incidence. And we see it uh, in Western Europe very much. We saw it also in Eastern Europe, in Romania, for instance, in the latter uh, 30 years, uh, the expect life expectancy uh, grew by eight, 10 years. So that, that's a lot. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, in this part of Europe, we combine uh, two trends. The trend of Western Europe, uh, we see a lot of breast cancer and colon ca colorectal cancer on one hand, but also lung cancer, which comes from other uh, countries, so which is representative for countries that are not that developed. And uh, of course, the other problems are uh, prostate cancer and then of course this cervical cancer which uh, is somehow partnered with, with the lung cancer in, in this uh, line. Uh, what we saw in the, in the latter, in the last year, in the latter couple of years, ever since the pandemic uh, uh, came, uh, we saw a significant decrease in the number of treated patients uh, I can I, I don't have a national statistics, but uh, what we see in this in the cancer center where I work, which is one of the the important ones uh, in Cluj, that's Transylvania, western part of, of Romania, and I, we spoke with our colleagues and saw the statistics from Bucharest. Uh, last year, thirty percent of our patients, uh, or let's put it other way. Uh, we, uh, the number of cycles of chemotherapy decreased by 30%. Uh, we lost plenty of patients in surgery in um, cervical cancer, and these were the early stages because uh, prophylaxis screening was banned somehow. We just followed the, uh, what, uh, other countries did in, in Western Europe, for instance, and uh, the, this was uh, early, very early, uh, the recommendation of uh, societies. Uh, so we uh, lost uh, cervical cancer patients. We have lost some uh, breast cancer patients, uh, which may be some of them prolonged their uh, neoadjuvant uh, cancer treatment somehow. Uh, we lost plenty of ovarian cancer patients, which are sorry, your your. Uh, yeah, mind. when you say when you say lost, uh, professor, you, you mean they died or? or uh, of or... course, they died. Uh, we've lost. We we did not operate them, uh, which means that nobody operated them. Or, uh, as I will uh, mention later, they were badly operated in each and every. Uh, part of, of uh, surgery, surgical service, or maybe not. So, of course, they, they might have followed some chemotherapy, but uh, they, they died eventually. We, we have, we have uh, statistics, which I, I'm not sure whether it's uh, quite correct, but uh, a, a huge amount of our cancer patients died during this year. The percent is over 80. Uh, I, I'm not sure about these statistics. Uh, I, I didn't see the, the data and how we, it was done, but uh, the fact is that we've lost a huge number of our cancer patients. And of course, uh, bearing in mind the fact that aging of population is the, the most the important risk factor and that eventually we will lose many of our cancer patients on the other hand, of course, we, we see what we see is uh, this enormous, gigantic number of uh, cervical cancer patients, which uh, should not be there. You know, that, that uh, song, the things that should not be. Uh, and uh, of course, we can debate a lot on uh, breast and colorectal cancer as far as 
screening is concerned, also uh, cervical cancer. Um, this year, I have to, to say that in the later months, what we saw was a constant increase in the number of our cancer patients. Uh, and more or less, we, um, uh, we have the numbers from 2019 uh, in treatment, which is, which is good news. Uh, but this was like a couple of, of weeks ago. And as you know, we have this high incidence in COVID problems. And uh, apparently we did not reach the top uh, of, uh, of it. So uh, it's important in my opinion uh, to stay uh, COVID free in cancer centers. Uh, I guess it, it's paramount. Of course, uh, we started uh, in March or April, I guess, testing all, all our patients, which was great. Uh, and actually we continue, we still test the, the ones that need continuous, uh, that are inpatients. The ones that, that are inpatients are still tested uh, with or without vaccination because otherwise we'll end up with, with COVID cases uh, in, inside. Uh, this is as far as treatment is concerned. On the other hand, uh, we have to encourage, and we we did not on a national level, but also we've tried in the parliament, uh, but also with um, uh, local and regional partners to um, set up uh, information campaigns again on, on uh, vaccination and screening. HPV vaccination, I mean, and, and screening. Uh, of course, last month we started with, with breast cancer, uh, with basketball teams, everything that was, was feasible uh, because uh, somehow people <clears throat> forgot about cancer because we, we have this, this pandemic, which uh, is, uh, is a big problem. On the other hand, I, I see it as an opportunity. The fact that uh, vaccination, is an issue, is a, an important topic. And I, I think that we should ride this dragon uh, uh, at this point, because uh, it's, I will explain later if we'll, we'll have the time, why do I see that vaccination is the key here? And of course, also combined with screening, but we can end up with problems with, uh, if we increase too much screening uh, at one point. Sorry, your, your mic, uh, Mr. Taylor. You're very kind. That should be my job to say that someone else who's trying to speak is muted, but you're doing it for me, but I'm grateful to you. Um, maybe let's break off there. We, we, have, uh, we have a lot of time and we'll definitely come back to you. But maybe, Antonella, would you like to come in with the sort of patient perspective, um, which I um, assume would be quite close to that of a clinician uh, like Mr. Akimas Kadariu, but... Um, are there some um, nuances or uh, how, how do you see the situation from the patient's perspective? Okay, so well, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to represent uh, the patient's voice uh, and the European Cancer Patient Coalition now with uh, this uh, uh, very interesting uh, discussion. So um, uh, as you know, the European Cancer Patient Coalition is the largest uh, cancer patient umbrella organization in Europe uh, with over 450 members in 50 countries uh, globally. Uh, so we try to influence and contribute uh, to shaping the European and national political agenda on all uh, uh, issues related to cancer from diagnosis, uh, treatment access, uh, cancer uh, patients and carers, uh, quality of life, uh, survivorship, uh, uh, and having said that, I mean, despite uh, the huge uh, effort uh, that uh, we put uh, into this, uh, there is uh, cancer still remains uh, the biggest uh, uh, health uh, challenge of our time. Uh, in fact, in 2020, we had uh, 2.7 million people in the European Union uh, um, with uh, a diagnosis of uh, cancer. Uh, and uh, 1.3 million people uh, uh, lost uh, their lives, uh, died because of cancer. 
Uh, of course, uh, we acknowledge uh, that uh, last uh, year uh, was an incredibly challenging year, the, year with uh, the pandemic uh, changing uh, the, the way we live and work. And uh, this took a particular toll on the healthcare sector with hospitals overrun and uh, many ongoing treatments uh, were postponed, affecting high risk uh, groups uh, with the uh, cancer patients uh, among them, if not uh, the, 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 the most uh, uh, harmed by the, the new situation. Uh, and the, you know, the pandemic has uh, uh, disrupted cancer care and revealed the weaknesses of health systems in the whole of Europe and globally. So not only in Eastern Europe. And the, the aggravation of the COVID-19 pandemic on Eastern Europe is based on the fact that it affected a system that already had very important problems. And uh, these problems are also closely linked to major disparities that exist in access to cancer care and overall survival rates across Europe. So from the variability in cancer diagnosis, screening services, and unequal access to quality care and treatment options to inadequately implemented national cancer control plans, or lack thereof and disparities in survival and patient rehabilitation, and the, um, the, the realities of cancer patients in Europe differ tremendously. Uh, for example, uh, if uh, we look at uh, the uh, five-year uh, survival rates of cancer um, uh, across uh, Europe, uh, the gaps uh, are very significant. So regarding uh, just uh, if, if we look at the colon cancer screening, uh, the five-year uh, survival rate after treatment uh, averaged at uh, uh, 52% in Eastern European countries uh, compared to 63% in Western Europe. So this uh, to us uh, is unconceivable because uh, I mean, just uh, uh, the, the uh, inequalities uh, on, uh, on screening uh, are, um, uh, I mean, reflects then on the inequalities in the survival, uh, uh, overall survival rate. Uh, also, if we look at, uh, for instance, uh, uh, cervical cancer incidence and mortality rates in Romania are three times higher than in other European countries. Uh, if we look at uh, breast cancer, countries uh, such as uh, Bulgaria, Romania, and Estonia have a low five-year survival rate of 75 to 78% compared to Nordic and Western European countries with a rate of 82 to 87%. Uh, what's more, for all types of cancer, the range of uh, five-year survival rates can be as wide as 40% uh, in Bulgaria and 64% in Sweden. And uh, this is a result of inequalities across uh, the entire cancer journey, from diagnosis uh, to aftercare, and uh, those from Eastern European countries are more likely to experience uh, lack of access uh, to early screenings, as I mentioned, which of course uh, then lead to late uh, diagnosis, limited access to affordable care, medicines and trials, and the lack of information and awareness on their rights after cancer treatment. So all these inequalities are not acceptable to us. And this is why we have a lot of hope into the Europe's beating cancer plan. And we believe that the Europe's beating cancer plan can be a fundamental tool to reduce, if not eliminate, these inequalities across Europe. Also providing a framework of policies and incentives for their implementation across Europe. So this is, uh, uh, so then one important point of the cancer plan is around the coordinated efforts among and within member state countries. So this would uh, mobilize financial instruments to support the member states and enable the sharing of expertise and resources across the European Union by supporting countries, regions, and cities with less knowledge and capacity. So a helpful and vital first step to ensure the efficient implementation of Europe's beating cancer plan 
would be the accessibility of data and the importance of efficient and up-to-date cancer registries in each country. This will help researchers to exchange findings between small and larger member states and to have access to crucial health data on the potential causes of cancer and promising treatments for it. So uh, organizations such as the Central European Cooperative Oncology Group are creating committees from across Western, Central, and Southeastern Europe with the aim of harmonizing cancer treatments across these countries. And this research can be used as an example as to how we should move forward with cancer data at EU level. Addressing these issues is complex. Uh, uh, as the needs of Western Europe and Eastern Europe differ, and consistent data is still needed to pinpoint these differences, which are political, structural, uh, cultural. So uh, another key uh, thing to acknowledge is that uh, currently there are only six of the 13 Central Eastern European countries that, that have national cancer care plans in place. And this would take healthcare organizations, patient advocacy groups, stakeholders, politicians, and policymakers to come together to implement the changes, the structural changes needed. So investment in research, education, and training to retain professionals is another uh, in, in the clinical communities is also an important uh, um, challenge that uh, we need to, to face and uh, we need to acknowledge and face. Then there is the digital health, which is also a, a huge uh, contributor to greater patient empowerment, but it is also, you know, it came out very clearly during the pandemic that digital health is uh, fundamental and we, we need to acknowledge uh, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, reduce inequalities in uh, accessibility. To, to digital health. Now, very briefly to conclude, I would also like to stress that only what is measured uh, is done. So as much as we are uh, thrilled to see that Europe is planning to take radical steps now to handle the rising burden of cancer, it is equally important to ensure that effective implementation of the plan is, is made. So we have to act now to reverse the rising trend of cancer disease in Europe and the European cancer patient community now is ready to support the execution of the plan. So we need to make sure that the Europe's beating cancer plan includes in its implementation a framework to monitor progress and the success of the different measures in the plan and ideally under a broad governance of the, of the implementation. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Antonella. Um, the, you mentioned a lot about data and their digital health. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'd like to come to you next, uh, William, uh, of Open Sky. Um, if you could tell us, uh, uh, I'm afraid I don't know a great deal about your company and what it oh, does yeah. and the markets. It's, but um, do you want to just give us an overview of, yeah. of what you do and where and and how uh, what you do fits with some of the issues that uh, sure. Antonella uh, has flagged up there. And I'll come yeah, to you in a minute, that. Mike, if you can bear with us. Yeah, you're hearing me okay, Simon O? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Great, great, okay. Well, thanks very much for inviting me to talk uh, this really excellent discussion. Um, so what I'm going to do is, the question was, what can be done to address uh, inequalities? Um, so what I'll do is, I'll address this by trying to highlight things that I guess will enable us to make the best available policy choices. Um, and in particular, how we can learn and collaborate as member states across the, the EU. And there's probably a kind of a recurring theme that's been highlighted. Philippe started, or sorry, David started talking about the, the potential 27 speed Europe, which obviously nobody wants. Um, and Antonella has just been talking there in particular about the need for collaboration. And in my mind, certainly standardization across the, across the, the EU. Um, so what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about some of the things we've done here in Ireland and um, then I'll talk a little bit about maybe a potential European perspective on, on that and where we see this going. So <clears throat> just here in Open Sky, we're uh, an ICT consultancy. Uh, information technology is what is our business. 
Um, so I'm a technologist, not an oncologist or uh, a clinician, but so I would state that up front, it's a very important point to make. Um, and we've been working with Irish health authorities here for about 15 years across a range of different areas. And one of those has been the, the maintenance and ongoing support of the immunization system for, for schools here, which includes the HPV vaccination, also MMR, MENC, TDAP, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and what I want to talk about is the way that we can use data systems and digitization to support vaccine preventable uh, diseases. I'm working on a project at the moment with an oncologist who is a really good line of that the best way to deal with cancer is to not get it in the first place. And so this is what's really important here is the actual uh, vaccine preventable diseases. Well, data is fundamental here. So, and it's data has a whole life cycle here, how we capture it, how we use it, its potential to save lives in terms of you know, assisting policy design, highlighting at-risk groups and so on, and also how we present it and how it's perceived, okay? I might just give, just on, on the whole point of perception, which is, which is really important. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, the perception of vaccines about their efficacy and their safety is often kind of like shrouded in a fog of alternative facts and so on. And, uh, you know, sometimes the truth can be uh, lined up against a whole bunch of alternative truths. We had this kind of a scenario here in Ireland by the time we got to 2014, with an excellent vaccination uptake for, for HPV, the stage one um, vaccination statistic, for example, was at 90 percent by, by 2014. In the following uh, year to 18 months, then we had a, a range of lobby groups who started putting forward alternatives on, on the safe, safety and efficacy of the vaccine, which just weren't accurate. But however, it was very high impact. And we saw that particular statistic, statistic drop by 30 percent over the course of the following 12 to 18 months which really was something that had to be addressed here in Ireland. And, you know, there was a range of actions, actions that were taken to do that. There was a, a national steering committee put in place. There was focus groups held with parents. The information material that was being put out there was revised. There was input from, from girls who had vaccine, from mothers and parents. There was international experts uh, brought in. There was further initiatives, in particular initiatives uh, in the training of the vaccination teams uh, and their collaboration with teachers, the greater involvement of teachers and so on such that by the time we got back to our data statistics, which are for 2020, that the, the stage one for HPV is back up to uh, 82%. I think one of the things it shows you is that even where we have things like a good vaccination uptake, that it's a, it's a precious thing and it's not something that can be taken for granted and needs to be monitored on, on an ongoing basis. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about the, we're talking the theme here in general is inequalities. Now we're talking about inequalities um, from a Central and Eastern European perspective, um, I would say that we don't uh, have a huge footprint. We don't have a huge footprint in terms of uh, health systems in Central Europe. But what I will do is just talk about inequalities. Inequalities exist everywhere. They exist within Ireland, uh, within regions within Ireland, and so on. And I'm just going to talk a little, little bit about how data has a role to play there and how information systems have a role to play there. So in our system with, with the schools vaccination systems, schools immunization system, excuse me, we capture characteristics at the school level. So that would be the school ethos, the disadvantaged uh, status of the school, its co-educational status and so on. Uh, and then monitor things like the uptake uh, of the vaccination across those different uh, characteristics. Um, so, for example, we do see in terms of disadvantaged uh, uh, schools here, you see a mean uptake of uh, about 5% lower than what you would see in non-disadvantaged schools. Although, interestingly enough, we don't see a huge difference when it comes to religious ethos of, of, the, of the schools and so on. So the question would be then, how would you design policy instruments then to actually you know, deal with this? And, and there can often be challenges with that, especially with, with the data and how we're capturing the, the data, the level of granularity that we can actually get. So that the people who know their students best, for example, would be the parents and then the teachers. The vaccination teams are only coming in once every year and they only see those, those people once, once or twice. So, you know, capturing information down to the granularity of the students, such as, you know, things like ethnicity, language capability, literacy, the literacy of the parents and so on is really crucial influencers of things. However, we not, may not always be in a position to capture that either ethically, legally, um, from a, a, the data protection rights of those individuals. Um, but obviously the role of the teacher is crucial as the interface to the, and I'm talking primarily here about Ireland where the vaccination program is, is driven entirely uh, through schools or 
but sorry, the vast majority of, of through schools. And um, so just to expand on that point uh, on data, we're about to do a, we just started a very interesting project with um, MSD in partnership with the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And what we're looking at is the state of the art if, in the use of information and data uh, systems across the European Union, okay? And information that's used to monitor uh, vaccinations and cancer registries. Um, those are two very specific things because they're, they're really important from a technologically and a, and a policy perspective. So for example, I, I mentioned policy there, are, are the vaccination programs, are they in place? Are they strong in the first place? Are they schools based? Um, what is the role of teachers within those? If teachers are involved, is there collaboration with vaccination teams? How are the campaigns run? How are the data protection constraints dealt with and so on? We'll be looking at that on a pan-European uh, basis. We'll also be looking at the technological infrastructure and the methodologies that are used. Uh, so for example, how the information is captured on the vaccination event, is it done in real time? Is it captured on paper? How is that information uh, fed into a central uh, system if it is fed into a central national system? Um, and how might the data quality be uh, rated for something like that? Uh, is it digitized and so on? Is that information linked to a unique health identifier? Um, and I mentioned, for example, the, the approach to, to GDPR and so on. And what we'll be looking to do is to see the potential for standardization across member states at a technological and policy level to improve things like the information. And then again, it's something back to uh, what Antonella said there, the, the, the vital importance of, of data being captured correctly, stored correctly, so that it can be used by researchers. Um, so for, for example, we could be talking about linking information across member states. If we had a standardized uh, dictionary to say these, whatever to, you know, uh, nomenclature we're going to use around vaccination and cancer registries and even non-cancer registries that we can link all of this information together so we can do things like longitudinal studies. The first uh, girls who have gone through the vaccination uh, uh, campaigns here in Ireland back in 2010 have already started to go through the cancer screening registries now over the last couple of years. Um, so joining that information together will be crucial and from a longitudinal perspective to actually analyze the outcomes um, for people who've been vaccinated and what those endpoints are. And again, whether they're uh, cancer endpoints, there are other endpoints as well, non-cancer endpoints. If we can capture that information and feed it into systems like this, uh, it becomes really, really important. Um, because then as re any researchers on this uh, webinar will be able to tell you, you can then uh, coalesce that information with external data sets such as economic indicators, demographic information, so on and so forth. And when we have all of those things in place, we then get to use all the wonderful cloud technologies that we have like machine learning algorithms and so on that can detect patterns and uptake, uh, can predict outcomes and can uh, predict or can put forward preventative uh, measures and policies and so on that we can use as a, as a tool set uh, to actually drive better outcomes and drive better up things like uptake and so on. Um, Simon, you're putting your hand up there. I'm, I'm running out of time, aren't I? I think you're on mute as well. Sorry. Yeah, no, I just, um, that, 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 that's great, William. I, I was, I was going to sort of just cut you off and, and, and make sure that we, we give Mike the floor and then we can, sure. we can come back to. Uh, did you have anything else that you wanted to say urgently at that point? Or is that a the, the main point I was just, just to finish off on the project that we'll be doing with MSD was that we'll be looking for opportunities to do, I mean, back to something that Antonella was saying there earlier, that the potential for standardization across the block, which is actually something that will be a real uh, uh, tool to actually address things like inequalities across uh, various areas, whether that's Central and uh, Eastern Europe, or even within particular areas, which may be in, even Western areas where you'll have disadvantaged pockets within them and so on. So that's uh, the goal of some of the things we'll be working on. Okay, great. Thanks, um, thanks William. Sorry to, to have uh, interrupted you there. Uh, let's come uh, in the, at the end of this sort of first round to Mike Morrissey, Chief Executive of the European Cancer Organization. Uh, I don't know, there's probably actually, well, I'm going to say there's probably, I don't know what's left to say after all of that, but there's probably quite a lot to say, Mike. I hope there is, for your sake, anyway. <laughs> well, thank you, Simon, for the opportunity and great to hear from the other speakers already because the European Cancer Organization is in the business of of facilitating consensus in cancer policy. Our, our members, we're a federation of uh, 36 oncology societies and, and 20 European uh, patient groups, including ECPC, our largest uh, patient advisory committee member. And we are an inclusive organization that tries to 
support progress in cancer care. And I think it's very, going back to the points that were made by Patricio earlier, I think there's, there's no question that COVID has shone a light on uh, a lot of issues in cancer care across Europe, um, which we need to which we need to address. And of course, some of those issues have got worse during the COVID period. If you take a look at time to act cancer.com, uh, where we've been running a campaign in 30 languages together with other organizations, you'll see some data on there, which is pretty worrying, um, particularly in the prevention space, you know, screening appointments canceled as Patricio was, uh, was discussing pretty worrying stuff. And I think one of the most important things we uh, are working with Antonello and ECPC and others on is the issue of data that, that continues to measure um, inequalities and measure success, hopefully. Our big hope, of course, is that having called for EU intervention in cancer care for many years, that the combination of the beating cancer plan, the cancer mission, the billions of euros being put into cancer in the, in the coming years, our hope is that we will be able to address some of these deep seated in many cases issues, which have not been helped by the national competence issue and which the beating cancer plan has a chance of resolving uh, regardless of the national competence issue. I think the, the great thing about the beating cancer plan is it prioritizes prevention. Prevention is definitely its strongest pillar. And it says, how is it that uh, in some countries and regions of Europe, prevention is much more effective uh, in those countries than in other countries? William was talking a lot about HPV vaccination and our HPV uh, Action Network has done a lot of work on this. Um, and it's, it's incredible that there is such a wide variety of practice across regions and countries um, for a preventable cancer. All you've got to do is have the vaccine and you prevent that cancer. Well, you know, we should be, we should be doing a lot better job on that. Um, and the Beating Cancer Plan has HPV as part of it, as a flagship policy, HPV elimination, as a flagship policy. And we think, rightly so, the, the call for a tobacco-free generation is a, is a big headline. But it's, it's, it's a really strong one. What we need, of course, is national cancer plans. And Antonella rightly pointed out the gaps in Central and Eastern Europe in national cancer plans. We need, we need them to um, make the beating cancer plan live in their countries, be dynamic in their countries, um, hopefully with resources from different organisations and support from different organisations across healthcare, including the EU, to make this stuff happen, because it is as close as unforgivable as it can be that the prevention issue is such a big issue across countries that there's, there's lots of, in that issue, we know prevention, there's early detection, there's screening, and there's lots of practical elements to all of that. But, but it really should be the, the focus of uh, national cancer plans to make sure that people don't get cancer in the first place, as was said, as was said earlier. But to be able to do all of this, to be able to measure the success of the beating cancer plan, you've got to have measurement. It's no good doing all of this work and pumping all this money and resource into it if you don't have a, a way that the public, not a load of academics somewhere, the public can understand whether the plan has been successful or not and where the gaps are not always between countries not always between regions uh, but sometimes within one city that you've got a wide variety uh, because of socio-economic reasons for example one poor part of the city one richer part of the city and you've got very very different um, standards of cancer prevention and care so we're all for um, identifying that and we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago in our inequalities network with OECD 
that have been commissioned by the commission to put together the cancer inequalities registry we're keeping our fingers crossed that that really helps us address some of these issues and and is is really something that's public facing that's simple to understand that can be that can really touch politicians policymakers and the public in their in their work on uh, prevention amongst other things but you know inequalities is a big topic too and inequalities is not just about geography there's a lot of inequalities relating to gender sexuality socioeconomic uh, and others that we think ethnicity of course is an important one we think it's important that geography has its rightful place in the inequalities debate but it's not exclusive and i know iarc um, and the OECD are are talking about this. How how can we best make sure that we are in our in the high hopes that we have for Europe's beating cancer plan? We can make sure that we tick off as many inequalities as possible. But prevention should be one where we can where we can be optimistic, um, as always, by working together as one European cancer community. Okay. Great, thanks very much, Mike. And uh, we're sort of into the final half an hour of the webinar, so let's open up a little bit. I, I just, if I make one quick observation, I wonder if one, if there's one positive effect of the COVID pandemic is that actually there's massive attention on the level on the vaccination rates um, now that might actually be beneficial. Um, looking at other um, other diseases. Um, I don't know if it will work like that, but I mean, obviously countries are keen to show off the percentage of people that have been double vaccinated, et cetera. So there might be a, maybe one positive element there. That's um, really, I was going to say, so, sorry, Simon, I just think that's, please, such, no, go on, that, please. that's such a strong point. And we've been in touch with ECDC about this because the impact of them demonstrating to the public the power of vaccinations in different countries in Europe, the same mm -hmm. thing could be done for HPV. Mm -hmm. Now, they haven't got the resources, it's not the focus right now, but, mm -hmm. but that's what we've been calling for with ECDC. That, that, that's what the public want to see, and that's what get th gets things moving. Yeah, and of course, um, communication is always a, a major challenge in all public policy, but I don't know whether you can say more in health policy than others, but but it's as important. I just want to come back to uh, Professor Akimas Kadari. Um, just an interesting point there. I was struck by the number of speakers that emphasised uh, the the importance of data, data collection, effective measurement. As a clinician, is is that a, is that also a priority for you, or? Um, or is that not, you know, is that is, is that a distraction from spending precious resources on treatment? Or how do you see the value of that, of, of, of having data? I mean, I, I liked Antonella's phrase about only that which gets measured gets done. Do you, um, do you share that view? Oh, well, that is the only correct view, in my opinion. Uh, I, <clears throat> we sometimes have meetings and I have uh, colleagues who, say they they treat cancer and i say well where's where's the data uh where's the evidence i mean otherwise you you can be the, the best surgeons in, in the country uh, show me the evidence well i had i mean I, i'm a lucky guy uh i've worked in this cancer center uh, in cluj uh, which is the one that has an active and um uh, uh, let's say a long living uh, registry, uh, which is the only registry that uh, reports okay. to IARC okay. data from Romania, uh, which of course gave me uh, a very correct uh, view on, um, on what's to be done. And uh, we've sent our data in the Concord 2 and Concord 3 studies and uh, hopefully our survival, I mean, the survival of our patients uh, is somehow um, very similar to what we see in Western Europe, which makes us proud. Uh, we've uh, been through the accreditation process with our cancer center by the OECI, and currently we are uh, accrediting our breast cancer at the German Society of, of Cancer. Uh, so that's, of course, a big plus. 
uh, still, uh, I, I have to, to thank everybody uh, in, in this panel. And of course, I, I follow the tremendous work of Mrs. Cardone ever since years now. And uh, I'm very proud to be part of this panel together with, with uh, Mrs. Cardone. And uh, uh, Mr. Flanagan show, showed us uh, great uh, substance. But I have to say that uh, Mr. Morrissey helped me a lot uh, because um, uh, what he mentioned uh, showed me that we are on the right path with the uh, cancer plan. Um, our cancer center, I mean, uh, we, we did plenty of work in, in, in cancer in this country. So we, what we did in 2012, we uh, convinced the IAEA to bring uh, an assessment of our country, uh, an assessment, uh, the, the impact mission, you know, from the atomic agency from Vienna. Uh, okay, I, I, I was, you know what, I was just going to ask to explain that acronym and I thought that sounds the, like the Atomic the, Energy the, Agency. Yeah, but... it is the Atomic Agency, yeah, and uh, ever since, so uh, we managed to, to have the, the, the full assessment of our country and the picture. Of course, plenty of things changed from 2012 uh, uh, to 2021, but uh, even though uh, we have more uh, capacity in radiotherapy, both uh, public and private, still we cover only 60% from what we would need in terms of, of radiotherapy. So uh, what uh, I was uh, starting to say is, yeah, uh, we need, of course, prevention, we need screening, uh, but if we will push on screening, we'll end up with plenty of lesions in terms of, uh, yeah, cervical uh, precancerous or uh, dysplasias or cancer then in breast uh, and of course in, in colorectal. And if we lack the proper centers to treat them, we'll end up with uh, over treatment or under treatment, which is uh, both incorrect. So what we, what we need to do in our uh, NCCP for the, for the next year, years uh, is of course uh, develop uh, pro pr primary and secondary prophylaxis, but also strengthening our uh, treating cap diagnostic and treating capacities. Um, now, uh, you, you mentioned uh, inequalities. Uh, we see them inside our own country and Eastern Europe countries see them a lot, uh, urban, rural, uh, uh, socioeconomic, ethnicity. Yeah, we have the Roma uh, people and we, we had some very nice uh, projects on Norwegian funding, um, attacking the barriers towards diagnosis and, and treatment on, on these particular groups, uh, the people that are up in the mountains, the people from the Danube Delta, so uh, there are uh, a number of, of uh, areas which have no family doctors, which are not very well, they're, they're not covered at all, maybe uh, by a proper, a proper medical system. So we see a lot of these inequalities and we have to tackle them as well in the uh, NCCP. Now, um, overall, uh, of course, we might lack uh gadgets in terms of mammographs or colonoscopes or and of course specialists because we have to train them in into parallel uh, but if we we look at um cervical cancer which is our let's see biggest problem uh i was uh, frequently asked what can we do in order to cover the gaps with western europe well western europe and uh, Northern Europe started in the 50s screening by means of cytology. Of course, uh, this is not the 50s that we have uh, today. And we, we have, first of all, vaccination, which uh, uh, is, is the, the, the main issue. We have, of course, cytology, but uh, as it, it, it would be very complicated to train as many cytologists uh, in a country like Romania, 
but we have uh, screening by means of HPV. And we have the combination, we have the faster HPV uh, uh, model. Uh, so we, we have all, all the new technologies the, uh, that, that come uh, in, in, the, in 2000, in, the, in this uh, decade. So I guess if we would uh, cover them by, by means of the RNCCP, we could, I mean, not uh, uh, cover 90% uh, by, by means of vaccination. By the way, we have 5% at this point. How, uh, I mean, a, a proper NCCP should look uh, as, as measurements, as Mr. Morrissey said, we, we cannot hope to cover 90% of our population by in four or five years if we uh, have 5% have by now. Uh, still, it, it would be the, um, the, the most, uh, the, the easiest uh, way of uh, fighting cervical cancer uh, under these circumstances. And of course, uh, trying to, to combine uh, uh, HPV screening, uh, we see, we, we saw the, the example of Turkey. Uh, they, they did a great job in, in terms of, of uh, uh, self-sampling and HPV uh, screening, which would be very acceptable in terms of our uh, psychosocial way of, of uh, in the, our psychosocial model. Yeah, some some uh, women might uh, feel uh, uncomfortable with uh, seeing a doctor. Uh, still, uh, self sampling uh, it, it would be uh, the, the the way. Uh, in terms of remote population or uh, colposcopy and uh, telemedicine, sending images uh, to to centers in. Um, in uh, cities would uh, would help a lot. So all new technologies could could help us in in closing or uh, making this gap not not that uh, that uh, big. Um, oh, I'm unmuted. Um, we're kind of coming close to the final quarter of an hour of the discussion. Um, I just want to invite uh, people following us online. If they have some questions, you can use the chat function. And uh, if we've got some topics or some interesting questions, um, I will um, pick them out and ask them to our panelists. Um, just uh, maybe moving to a sort of political and economic uh, discussion, obviously the um, the coal face of this is actually diagnosis and treatment, but I um, just wanted to ask our various panelists, um, do you think there's an opportunity in the post, it's not quite, I wish we were in the post COVID era, but um, uh, after COVID now or after the peak of COVID, I don't, I don't know, I, you, I, you can't sort of say any of these things with confidence, but do you think do you think there's an opportunity to make arguments about the value of prevention uh, of screening? Um, uh, because obviously resources, public resources are always finite. There's going to be greater pressure to reduce the debts that have been accrued because dealing with um, the economic impact of the COVID crisis. And yet within the national pictures, we see you know, um, some of the poorer, you know, not the wealthiest EU member states, Hungary has a good record of vaccination. So it's possible to have good outcomes with well-designed policies. So I just wondered whether our speakers thought that there was an opportunity um, for a rethinking of uh, healthcare uh, policy strategy uh, and the priorities within it. Because I I've been quite struck by you're all positive but i suppose you're all thinking of patients welfare and even even if the even if the task is hard um one one would never give up and we i see we have a question from the audience but let, let me just ask my question or ask the, the panelists to come in on my question if uh, if some of you would like to do that just well i can definitely oh antonella please yeah right well i can definitely 
uh, start the or get the ball rolling on this issue, as it was already mentioned uh, uh, before, the best treatment to cancer is never get cancer. Uh, and uh, uh, this is showed uh, even more uh, clearly by the pandemic. I mean, uh, before, uh, um, uh, I, mean, the, any, I mean, the prevention is the uh, best investment that can be made in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, from any healthcare system for any disease. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and even more so that is uh, true for cancer. Okay. And, yeah. do you, and do you think that there's a greater appreciation of that uh, to, to make that argument now with, uh, in the wake of COVID? Uh, well, definitely, yes, because there is a, uh, you know, we always uh, mention raising awareness among the general population and uh, uh, nothing has uh, raised the awareness uh, more than uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, I mean, it has reached everybody. Uh, even, I mean, with the, with the people who... Uh, are against uh, the vaccination. They are even making a, a very good uh, uh, publicity to the importance of being vaccinated, uh, to be frank, uh, on, uh, on any disease. And, um, uh, and so that is uh, uh, very important. And now it's uh, on, the, on the mouth of everybody uh, that how, how important it is uh, a, a vaccine for, uh, uh, for, for, for the health of the citizens. So. I think as well, Simon, just the, there's, there's a level of fanaticism in, that's developed in the COVID-19 anti-vax type scenario that I'd be somewhat worried there may be some overspill then to other vaccination programs that are already well established, yeah. well proven, yeah. such as HPV, that we need to be ready to see some kind of overspill on that uh, and to be able to deal with that. And maybe not necessarily by um, marginalizing and trying to alienate people who are making these arguments, but by reaching out to them and explaining that all the evidence is there, the efficacy is there, the safety of these vaccines is there. And particularly in the case, in case of Gardasil, it's been there for, for many, many years now, and the track record is there. Okay, great. Mike, did you want to come in? I think. Yeah, I mean, I think every health system is different, right, in, in whatever country or city you're in. And some health kit systems are great you know I can tell you about a loved one of mine in the UK she felt a lump in her breath breast she was she went to a one-stop shop center she had a biopsy a mammogram a comparison to her previous mammogram she was diagnosed the following week she was operated on the following week three weeks really impressive stuff right and in even in rich countries that is not always the case yeah indeed and so you know you know a health system that's got its act together in that kind of situation you feel it right it's a human thing that the that the the system is ahead of you as a patient almost right and that that energy and that dynamism is about organization it's not just about money it's not about yeah. money. it's about organization but then you've got the other piece in the jigsaw for the health system that isn't quite in fifth gear, like it should be. And that's about patients and their loved ones asking the right questions. And having high levels of health literacy, as people like I, uh, me call it, you know, like patients feeling empowered, knowing the questions to ask to get the best out of their healthcare system. It's a combination of, of the two things. And I very much agree with what Antonella said. Because of COVID, people are more ready to ask questions, more conscious of, healthcare issues, more conscious as well, I think, that both COVID and cancer don't have borders. And so the approach of cross-border exchange and of experience and resources is much more easily accepted in the COVID context than it was in many political quarters, let's say, pre-pandemic. Uh, Good. If no one else wants to come in on that question, uh, we have a question online from Yelka Draskovic. It's for you, Professor Akimas Kadariu. Uh, what should the priority be for Central East European countries to meet the vaccination gap? Updated NCCPs, increased funding of immunization programs, include improved health literacy or investment in digitalization? Well, I think you've kind of mentioned all of those, but uh, I hate I that you like pick. 
to thank uh, Ms. or Mrs. Trashkovich for, for the question. Yeah, a little bit of everything. Uh, six years ago, as a uh, Minister of Health, uh, we finalized also a, pro a program for um, uh, improving health literacy, and uh, but they, they've never used it. Uh, with, uh, we did it together with UNICEF. Uh, I think uh, it, it was quite well rated. Uh, I've told them that if we will continue, if we have complexes with the Latin language or uh, maths will end up dead, but uh, knowing uh, plenty of maths. And um, so uh, this should have been done at that point. And I, I reckon it would have helped a lot uh, during the pandemics. Uh, still, so this, this should be done all, all the time, but what we have learned, that we as a country we had uh, funding for uh, HPV vaccination in 2007-2008, and after one round we end up uh, with two point something percent, and after a second round we ended up in uh, four uh, percent, more or less like Japan, a catastrophe, of course different reasons. I'm not going to debate on them. So uh, yeah, you might have money, but if we, uh, what we see now uh, with the, the uh, anti-COVID vaccination, uh, if you don't have a proper campaign and we've learned from our uh, colleagues from the UK, uh, how a proper campaign should be done, we will end up in this uh, useless percentages. Uh, the, what, uh, in the UK was done was one pound for vaccine, one pound for the information campaign and the proper information campaign, which we lacked uh, also during the COVID times. Because uh, if you don't trust the authorities, if you don't trust yeah. the government, uh, if you don't trust the Minister of Health, if you don't trust anybody, if you see some of them uh, wearing or not wearing masks during the COVID, uh, this will be uh, useless. So of course, yeah, we need to invest in health literacy. It will take a generation. We, we have to invest in digitalization. This might take uh, five years, but in order to, to have a proper immunization program, we have to communicate uh, with each and every uh, group of people, with the youngsters, with their mothers, with the, the more, more religious groups, mm. uh, with the ones who might end up uh, with uh, what in Japan uh, happened uh, with the, and of course the anti-vaxxers uh, which are there, uh, but uh, that, that, that's, that's what the ones from the rural uh, areas, the ones from the urban areas, um, so all actors should be there. And of course, in, in a country like mine, uh, church is also very important. So uh, all, all uh, churches should, should be involved uh, as well as, as all other uh, people who can really uh, influence uh, people in, in getting vaccinated. Okay, I mean, I'm aware that um, uh, you're being called upon to answer a lot of questions, Professor, but it's because you represent the clinician side and the pol or you've uh, and the politician side, although you've sort of distanced yourself from the politician side. But, but as you were saying about the the lack of take up of your uh, your first attempt to, or your your earlier your an earlier version of the national cancer plan, how, how does it how does it work in a government? I mean. That um, within a government to to make the case for the prioritization of healthcare spending, and I mean, I suppose that that isn't even uh, the the national plan isn't even a spending issue. I I don't know whether it takes up a lot of resources, but it's just to make it a policy priority. Um, what, what what kind of what, what kind of arguments do you have to be prepared for and defeat to make that? And and I suppose is that you, you know is that again going to be slightly easier in the wake of COVID? Well, again, a very complicated uh, answer. Because if I just say something else, because I think we all agree, you know, we all, everyone, I mean, it's also, it's clearly in the choice of panelists and the choice of expertise, but everyone agrees that, you know, tackling cancer is a good thing and it should be a greater priority and there's the right way to go about it. But, but 
clearly it doesn't it, it doesn't convert into into political priorities so let, let me put it this way uh i'm very angry uh about last week i've seen a 29 year old lady with a breast cancer which had no genetic assessment uh nobody knew where the tumor was anymore because uh uh, they uh, forgot to clip it uh, and uh, started uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And after five cycles, uh, the tumor uh, disappeared. Uh, the genetic uh, assessment was negative. So how could a surgeon explain to that lady that she needs a mastectomy because uh, everybody else was stupid before? How right. can uh, somebody explain to another uh, 20 Okay, nobody asked her about uh, children or anything. How can you one explain uh, what happened to another 26 year old lady, which I, I saw again last week, uh, which had uh, a dysplasia of the cervix and ended up uh, with, uh, 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 it's very complicated to explain how somebody performed a, a colonization with uh, a monopolar and ended up with a monopolar in her rectum. So this, this is the problem. Uh, I mean, if people would realize that those ladies could have been their daughters, their wives, their relatives, I, I, I don't see any other uh, way of, of explaining things because I mean, it's very important to see all, all these I mean, catastrophes. Uh, how, how could I? How, should I put them? I mean, plenty of sufferance, uh, which could be avoided, especially in cervical cancer. I mean, with one shot or a couple of them, or maybe three of them, if, if you're older uh, or if you had the cone. I mean, we have meta analysis for uh, uh, vaccination after, uh, after colonization for dysplasia. So we, we have plenty of evidence here, and we can avoid, I mean, plenty of sufferance and death. And this is, I mean, if, if this is not uh, an argument, then I, I don't see any other arguments. Okay, yeah, sorry, very, very dispiriting, but unfortunately the way it is. Um, we're into the final minutes of the webinar. I'm, I, I, I'm personally felt we could have gone on for at least another half an hour um, and, and learnt more. Um, but that's not possible. Uh, I'm going to hand over in a minute to David just to make some very brief concluding remarks because I do know for webinars that everyone likes to finish uh, at the uh, at this pre-scheduled time. I'm just going to very quickly thank all our speakers today, um, particularly you, Professor, because it's a very difficult uh, time in Romania. Uh, but everyone else, Mike, William, Antonella, who uh, agreed to join us at very short notice, we appreciate that very much. And Philippe, if you're still um, on the call, um, <clears throat> lots, I, I can't see at the moment whether you are, but I know you were, uh, so, oh, you were there. Okay, yes, great. I'm okay. here, I was just letting great. the experts. I hope, I hope you found it useful and informative Very. and, and uh, given you lots of, and of course we continue all these conversations uh, offline. The full um, uh, discussion will be, has been recorded and will be posted online. Uh, as is the previous uh, discussion from the webinar earlier this year in June and the two that we had um, uh, last year as well when we first started um, doing these webinars. But uh, I, you have a minute, David, to make concluding remarks. But uh, thank you, David and MSD, for making this possible. And thank you to everyone who's joined us online. And thank you very much to you, Simon, and thank you from MSD to all of our participants, both speakers and, and audience. This is obviously an incredibly important moment in European history. We need to address the pandemic of COVID and the pandemic of cancer together. And the linkages between cancer and COVID are so important, as all of our speakers have demonstrated. Um, just a few simple points that we can make from the discussion, I think, Simon. Uh, clinicians, patients, researchers all mostly agree. Inequality across the entire patient journey, as Antonella pointed out, is, is so important to, to be addressed. Better coordination is needed across Europe. Better data is needed. And gradually, as a society in Europe, 
we're getting much better um, at comparing and contrasting data across Europe, uh, as William mentioned. But if there's a single conclusion, it's that we need to get past the idea of coordination and cooperation and really start to, to look at the contribution that Europe can make. Um, I think Mike, Mike really wrapped it up really well. That national, the national competency issue hasn't helped and it isn't helping. On COVID, we've worked together as Europeans on a health issue far better than we've ever worked together as Europeans. Only this morning, the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, pointed out that he's, he's now chaired 16 discussions of the European Council focused on COVID. We need to focus attention now on cancer. Perhaps we need to put the pandemic of cancer on the next 16 meetings of the European Council. Uh, but let me just conclude by saying again, thank you very much to, to everybody. As I said at the beginning, we're starting to measure the cost of non-Europe in human lives. And this is unacceptable as Europeans. Hopefully we can build on Europe's beating cancer plan to overcome this. Uh, I'm really glad we've had such a good discussion. Thank you very much, everybody, again. Thank you, Simon. And back to you, Simon. Thanks, David. Thank you to everybody again and um, look forward to uh, uh, speaking to you again soon.